Thanks, Paul. Welcome to our April 2022 webinar, Optimism in Q1 in the Shape of Things to Come, where we'll take a look at offshore rig market trends from the first quarter and provide an outlook for the market. As Paul said, my name is Cinnamon Edgerlin, and I'm joined by my colleague, Sarah McLean. Today, we'll cover three broad topics, starting with the team intro, then Sarah will go over the first quarter trends, and I'll return to pick up with our near-term outlook. After that, we'll hand it over to Paul to lead the Q&A. So as he mentioned, feel free to drop your questions in the Q&A box throughout the presentation. For anyone new to an SGN webinar, I'll start with a quick intro. SGN is a trusted provider of global data and analytics with a focus on the energy transition across ocean industries. Our integrated platforms empower you to make the right decisions for your business. Besides our rig analytics and rig values offerings, which we'll be using as a source of today's webinar, we also offer insight into rig and ship emissions with green packed rigs and green packed ships, as well as covering the offshore wind market through our wind analytics product. We've recently expanded our rig analytics team. On this slide, you'll see our four analysts along with the regions we each cover. We're happy to connect with you you can reach out to us here at SGN, or you can also find all of us on LinkedIn. Now over to Sarah for the first quarter recap. Thank you, Cinnamon, and hello to everyone joining us today. Overall, it's been another interesting quarter in the offshore rig market with a general mood of cautious optimism. The ongoing recovery from the pandemic and 2020 crash continues, but with some sustained challenges in logistics, supply and funding, especially for smaller operators. Additionally, some regions are seeing more accelerated recovery than others, particularly if you're looking in terms of day rates, with bidding ranges now hitting levels not seen since at least 2014 in markets such as the US Gulf of Mexico and South America. The quarter has also seen some turnaround for projects which had previously been stalled and now with increased threats to energy security, particularly in Europe, we've begun to see some existing requirements being fast-tracked, with this trend likely to continue moving forwards. But really wanted to kick off with some fast facts about the quarter, which give a broad overview of what we saw across key aspects of the offshore drilling market. So to start, we saw the Brent crude price rise by 31%, ending the quarter at $104 a barrel. For much of the quarter, and especially since Russia invaded Ukraine in February, oil prices stayed above that $100 mark. Already, this is significantly higher than the $80 mark that most E&P companies base their near to medium term plans on, so we could expect this to have the knock-on effect of ramping up rig demand moving forward. Competitive utilisation is also on the up and increased by 2% to reach 75% at the end of the quarter. According to our rig values database, the total fleet value rose by 4.6% and there were 10 rig sales completed during the quarter. The majority of these were sold to continue life as drilling rigs, six of them in total, with two sold for conversion and two to be recycled. On the flip side, there remain a total of 55 rigs under construction, which I'll go into further detail about in a few slides time. Lastly, in our rig analytics database, we added approximately 64 new rig requirements globally, which could amount to 60 years of backlog. The vast majority of the added fixtures are in shallow water markets, with a significant number coming from India, the Middle East, and from an uptick in Oceania. Deep water requirements are more evenly dispersed, but there's a clear uptick in the US Gulf of Mexico and Southeast Asia. If we turn to the charts on the right side of the slide, you can see the competitive utilisation for the quarter. It started out at 73% in January, dipped a little to 72% in February, before rising up to finish on 75% in March. You can also see the number of rigs drilling also picked up significantly during the quarter, from 428 to 430 on average each month. The last chart in this slide shows average day rates over the course of first quarter. There are a couple of points to make on this chart. Overall, drillship rates are rising, but at different levels due to faster recovery in some regions than others. So while we have seen rates fixed over 300,000 a day, we're still seeing the broad majority starting in the mid to high 200s. Semi rates are now averaging over 200,000 a day in both benign and harsh environments, while jackups are more or less on par in harsh environments. Benign environment jackups are on a downward trend though, due to a higher number of fixtures in markets with lower rates. Next slide, please. So as we're not too far into second quarter, I thought I would include this slide on the current global fleet status. 
Overall, there are 708 units semi-substrail ships and jackups which we track at SGN, of which 422 are currently drilling, 136 are warm or hot stacked, 95 are cold stacked and 55 are under construction. So throughout Q1, the number of rigs drilling rose by 2%, while the number of warm or hot stacked rigs decreased by 6% as more rigs returned to work, while the number of cold stacked rigs also decreased, both due to sales and also with some reactivation activity. The chart on the left shows how things are looking at the moment across each region. Unsurprisingly, the quietest regions are Alaska and the Baltic, each with only one rig. Work is yet to begin in Alaska while it's ongoing in the Baltic. Canada has no rigs working at the moment with two warm and one cold, but there will be a return to drilling activity there by the summer. As it stands, Central America also has no rigs drilling and five cold stacked units. The Caspian has five rigs working at the moment, all jackups, as there have been no semis working in the Caspian coming up for about a year now, and the majority of that semi fleet are now cold stacked. The majority of the remaining regions all have more rigs working than not. Southeast Asia, the Med and West Africa are outliers to this trend, but it should also be noted that these regions are high traffic stacking locations. The Canary Islands and Walvis Bay in West Africa, Greece and the Med, which is a high number of cold stacked transocean drill ships, and Southeast Asia, which is Singapore, which in itself is 23 rigs, either warm, cold or under construction. And just a final note on cold stacked rigs, as there does remain some scope for yet more older and longer stacked units to leave the fleet, either for recycling or conversion. This is despite the high numbers of attrition we saw during the previous downturn. Next slide, please. This third slide deals with the backlog and fixtures that was seen over the past quarter. For a little more context, I can also tell you that compared to first quarter 2021, there has been a 12% increase in the number of fixtures made and a 53% increase in the amount of backlog added. In total, there have been 94 fixtures made across all market segments during the quarter, the majority of them in the North Sea and Norway, the Middle East and the US Gulf of Mexico. Overall, seven global regions, namely South America, Southeast Asia, North Sea and Norway, US Gulf of Mexico, Middle East, Mexico and West Africa, have all seen at least five fixtures. The least active regions have been Central America, the Far East and the Med and Black Sea. Overall, there were 57 jackup fixtures during the quarter, 25 semi fixtures and 12 drill ship fixtures. And all of these together have secured a total 86.4 years of backlog. Since the beginning of this month, that number has risen yet more to 97 years, with many more multi-year fixtures expected in the coming months, especially from the Middle East. January fixtures saw a high level for average duration of fixtures at 568.7 days, but this fell quite significantly in February to 186 days on average. March saw fixture durations pick up again to an average 317 days. Just to give a little more context here, January alone saw 42 years of added backlog with a number of multi-year awards made for Saudi Arabia, the UAE and Qatar. There were also some longer scopes awarded in Mexico and the North Sea. February was much quieter in comparison, with only two multi-year fixtures made during this month, one in Saudi Arabia and one in Thailand, but the UK, China and India all also saw scopes of over a year fixed up. March saw further multi-year programmes fixed for India, Norway and Qatar, but overall the month's fixtures were dominated by scopes of a few months or less. Next slide, please. For this final Second for me, I'd like to cover some new builds. I mentioned earlier there are 55 rigs still classed as under 33 in total compared to 6 semi-subs and 16 drill ships. It's drill ships that have had the most activity in recent months. Transocean's 8th gen Deepwater Atlas and Deepwater Titan are progressing towards their maiden charters with Chevron and Beacon respectively, both jobs in the US Gulf of Mexico. Deepwater Atlas has been undergoing sea trials and is expected to begin phase one of its programme with Beacon in fourth quarter this year. Meanwhile, the Deepwater Titan has completed dry dock works and is expected to begin work with Chevron early next year, running into early 2028. Also in the US Gulf of Mexico is Samsung new build Santorini, which is now bringing its maiden contract with ENI under a bareboard charter with Saipem and is now firm until the end of 2023. Then we have Cobalt, which is currently en route to Turkey, as the fourth drill ship and first new build purchased by TPAO. It follows Fati and Uvus, the ex Deep Sea Metro 1 and 2, and Kanuni, which is the ex Artal. All three of those other TPA units are now in the Black Sea, where Cobalt, which will undergo a name change and some yard work on arrival, will join them. The final drill ship is for Stena, after the recently announced 7th Gen Stena Evolution, but as it stands, no further details of potential work for this unit have been made public. 
In comparison, the new build semi market is a little stagnant and there's not too much to report from that side. The arbitration process is still underway between Wilco and Keppel for Nordic Winter and Nordic Spring, with the first tribunal hearing scheduled for fourth quarter. But in the meantime, as was reported last year, Dolphin Drilling has secured the marketing rights for these seventh gen units. As it stands so, there's not too much visibility for anything lined up for them as yet. Finally, we're seeing some movement in the jackup fleet. Saipem announced recently that it would be bareboat chartering a new build CIMC jackup for work in the Middle East, while other recently announced contracts in the Middle East are understood to be for new build jackups. In addition, there's been an increasing trend, driven primarily by China for now, of using stranded jackups for conversion to be used in the wind installation market. While conversion for use in the wind market hasn't made too much impact on new builds yet, there have been instances recently of older jackups, semis or drill ships undergoing conversions for such work. That said, with such a high level of jackup stock and benefits including potential savings and reduced time to convert rather than build, there is scope for more of this activity within the marketplace. And with that, I'll pass back to Cinnamon. Thanks, Sarah. Starting with our global demand for jackups, semis, and drill ships, our forecast is that demand will rise about 18% between now and the end of 2024. This is likely on the conservative side, as operators are still renewing their, reviewing their portfolios in light of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the fallout as relates to hydrocarbon supplies. The biggest growth will be for semi-subs, which have been the slowest rig type to recover over the past couple of years. We estimate an increase of demand of about 45%. Regionally, most of the demand for semi-subs over the next couple of years is coming from the North Sea, particularly the UK, with Norway slightly behind. Next, we expect drill ship demand to grow up by about 30% over this period. The Americas will dominate drill ship demand, primarily South America and the US Gulf. But West Africa, which was slow to bounce back after the prolonged downturn, is picking up steam and we're seeing more plans emerge from that region as well. For jackups, we anticipate an increase in demand of about 15% globally. India is a region to keep an eye on for growth. Several multi-year tenders have come to market that will add double digit years of backlog once awarded. Mexico will also be a source of demand with the national oil company Pemex needing to replace or renew units rolling off charter at the end of the year. And most prominently, the Middle East will continue to be a hot spot for activity as drilling campaigns ramp up. Rigs will continue to be drawn from other regions to meet this demand. Early on in the recovery cycle, options were offered at low pre-priced rates. Given that day rates have since risen considerably, more recent options are generally at market rates. We expect most of the remaining pre-priced options will be exercised, with the newer market-priced options less apparent as to their general outcome. Notably, most of the requirements we're seeing remain short to medium term in nature, as rate contractors generally want to avoid locking in long periods when day rates are moving up, and operators are wanting to retain flexibility and be more resilient than in past up cycles when we saw a lot of multi-year charters locked in at high rates. This mainly applies to the floater market. For the jackup market, there are well over 100 units without work and nearly 100 managers for the global fleet, which makes it difficult to maintain discipline within the jackup market as a whole. Before the Russian invasion of Ukraine in late February, much of the talk from operators centered around pulling back and narrowing the focus of both exploration and development projects in response to the energy transition. Now we're hearing that some projects that had been shelved, or delayed, or postponed are being revisited. For instance, the UK's Cambo project is now getting a closer look. Discussions with our sources show some operators are reviewing their portfolios to see where production can be quickly added. In particular, we're hearing some European operators may pause their plans to drill in other regions of the world in order to focus their budgets on programs in Europe that would help boost gas supplies. Therefore, we fully expect to see pockets of increased requirements pop up as operators adjust their plans. Meanwhile, looking at the requirements with start dates out through 2024 that we are already tracking reveals that a full 50% are for development drilling projects. As you can see on the top chart, over 100 requirements with target start dates for the remainder of this year are still open. 
Many of these will be finalized, but we do expect some will be pushed into next year for reasons such as some operators are unhappy with rising rates, not just rig day rates, but for ancillary items as well, from tubular goods to support vessels and even labor and crewing costs. With financers having pulled back on investing in E&P companies over the past couple of years, this hits smaller independent companies a little harder as they have fewer sources to go to for financing. We also expect we'll see rig reactivations continue since more operators are moving forward with projects than are holding off and near-term availability of hot rigs remains tight, particularly for units with higher capabilities. Turning to our outlook for day rates, we expect rates to continue trending up across rig types for the next few years, with the biggest increases coming for premium high spec units. Regionality will continue to play a factor in the degree of the rise. For example, we've seen a lot of growth in drill ship day rates in the U.S. Gulf. This is driven partly by the regulatory requirement for high BOP sharing capabilities. Because of this requirement, not all rigs are able to work in the region without first needing to undergo certain upgrades. Speaking of the U.S. Gulf, our latest day rate forecast anticipates that 7th Gen drill ships will break the 400,000 mark within the next year. This will be driven by demand in the U.S. Gulf and off Brazil, both are which are locations where we've learned that multiple jobs over the past months have received a growing number of day rate bids that are in the low 400,000s. While no rates have been confirmed at that price yet, the market is quickly moving in that direction. Our market discussions also indicate that jobs in West Africa are now receiving bids over 400,000. To be clear, the day rates for the three announced 20K projects in the U.S. Gulf were excluded from the comment I just made. These rates are over 400,000, but these rigs have new technology and are outliers rather than setting the trend. For the sixth generation harsh environment semi sub market, we expect to see day rates increase next year as Norwegian demand will rise in response to energy security concerns. To support this, we're already starting to hear about some Norwegian tenders that will have quick turnaround periods for responses from rate contractors. As for jackups, premium units with emissions lowering equipment will command a premium. These units are generally harsh environment jackups, which are already at the top of the pricing range. As we near the end of our presentation, we wanted to give a quick update on the environment side. SGN has identified nearly 40 rigs with some type of emissions reduction system. These apply across all three of the major rig types. When breaking down the upgrades by rig type, we see that for jackups, selective catalytic reduction, or SCR systems, which reduce NOx emissions, energy emission efficiency, or EEE software, and hybrid power options are the most popular systems being installed. For semi-subs, the most popular systems are closed bus, heat recovery, and hybrid power. While for drill ships, SCR, closed bus, and hybrid power are the most installed systems. As expected, most of the rigs with some kind of emission reducing system are located off Europe, but not all. Several rigs currently operating in the U.S. Gulf and even a couple units off Brazil have at least one of the systems installed. We believe we'll continue to see units upgraded rather than simply building newer units. Although going forward, new units are likely to be ordered with one or more of the emission reducing systems to be built in. At the bottom of this slide, I've placed a snapshot from our Green Packed Rigs product, which has modeled the amount of emissions released by offshore rigs over the past 12 months. In all, the total estimated CO2 emissions was about 9.8 million tons, not counting the flaring. In summary, we saw some solid results in the first quarter of this year. Competitive utilization rose about 2%, and we expect it to continue to rise over the remainder of this year. Oil and gas prices have risen, day rates have risen, demand is growing. This has led to an increase in the total fleet value of nearly 5%. Globally, we're seeing an uptick in rig requirements for projects set to commence in the next couple of years. Next year, we should see two brand new rigs with 20K BOP stacks operating in the U.S. Gulf. Tight availability is pushing day rates up, which is a trend we expect to continue over the next few years. 
nearly 40 rigs have some kind of emission reducing system installed and plans are underway for more installations on other rigs. This will continue to be led by rigs working off Europe, but other regions are also working to move in this direction. That concludes our prepared remarks for today. We thank you for joining us and we'll pass it back to Paul to lead the Q&A session. Thank you, Cinema and Sarah. Some, a lot of strong information and some, uh, some key outlook forecasts. So thank you very much, guys. We, we, we have received a few questions through the, the Q&A box, which is still open there, if anybody else would like to add to that. But if, um, if I can go through a couple of them in the, in the few minutes we have remaining. Um, a lot of these are very regional-based, so I'm not sure who would be the best person to answer. But um, Canada, what, what's happening in uh, off Canada at this moment in time? Seems to be a lot of news coming out recently. Um, I could take that one, Paul. Um, Canada is very interesting. It, it used to have a pretty steady two to four rig um, program each year, but since COVID, we've seen that drop quite a bit. But we have one rig due to start next month, um, and then we have another one coming later this year, but both are for short-term programs. We've recently in the news saw the government gave the final approval for the Equinor's Bay to Nord program to go forward, but with over a hundred um, extra environment related requirements built in. I think what we'll see there is other operators kind of watching this program and looking to see how much extra time and cost will be added on uh, in order to make this program go forward uh, before we they make their decisions to move forward. So we also have several other programs that have been pending final approval as well. And so I think that's what we're gonna see for that. Okay, thank you for that it's one. It's just kind of a watch and see the, how the first one goes. Okay, um, jump, jumping over to Europe then, is, um, there's a question about our thoughts on the rigs that are presently stacked in the Canary Islands. Have we any thoughts on what's happening there? Um, yeah, I'll take that one. Um, so overall, there's still 10 units stacked in the Canary Islands, um, nine drill ships and one semi. Um, I'd say for the semi that there's a bit of potential for it to come back into work, especially if things west of Shetland start to pick up in the near term. Um, it's, it's a harsh environment, deep water rig. As for the drill ships, four of them already have contracts in place. Well, there's probably some scope for a, a couple more to come out of cold stack, but only if it's more long term work and a meaning multi year here that would make it worth the cost of reactivation. Um, and at least in one case as well, we're hearing some market chat about conversions in the in the for the wind market as well. So there is a little bit of potential for, for the rigs that are there at the moment. OK. Stay, staying over in that, in, that uh, in the European, then we also had a question around uh, around the Mediterranean. Are we seeing any drilling activity picking up in that region? Um, it's pretty steady in the Med. I would say, like the East Med, and especially is ongoing Egypt. Um, there's you know shallow water work going on there. A deep water scope is just finished, and there's some tendering activity for the future there. Cyprus, we should be we've just seen some work end there. Some work about to begin. And then Israel as well, um, energy and have a big scope there at the moment too. Um, so there could be a little bit more coming up in Greece as well, Italy. Um, yeah, so the, so the East Med is pretty much the big focus in the Mediterranean right now. Okay. Um, sw switching back across again, another regional question is, uh, what's the latest we're hearing on the lease sales in the US Gulf? Okay, that's back to me, Paul. Thanks. Um, so we don't have a new program in place. The current five-year program will expire in June. A couple of early steps were taken to start the next program, but it has not been completed yet. And with re required comment periods at the end of June, even if they were working towards one, Something interesting we did see uh, last week on Friday actually was the um, an update on onshore leasing where the Department of the Interior uh, is going to be removing about 80% of the nominated lands um, from onshore leasing. Uh, you're not going to say that's exactly what's going to happen for offshore, but I think that's um, a good idea of the direction that things are going. 
and that um, operators in the U.S. Gulf should maybe keep in mind, not only will we see a gap in lease sales, but there could be less acreage available and possibly more restrictions um, as far as areas and in order to drill. Okay. I think we, we have time for one more that's come through that just, just in a few seconds. And I think that this is the North Sea, I think. So I think this might be back to yourself, Sarah. Um, can you add a little bit more, mm -hmm. elaborate a little bit more on the mood semi look ahead for the UK and Norway sectors? Have we any thoughts on that area? Um, I think there's definitely a little bit of um, demand there at the moment. It is a little bit quiet in the UK at the moment. I think for 2022, maybe going into 2023, it is pretty quiet still. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's definitely, there is stuff there, but it is pretty quiet for, for the immediate um, term future in that market. Okay, we have a couple of more things, but I'm obviously conscious of the time. So um, I, I, we're really coming to the end of the allotted time. So I'd like to really close the meeting by saying you know, a huge thank you to everyone who attended today. Uh, for those few questions we didn't cover, uh, we'll reach out directly to those individuals over the next couple of days and answer them questions then. Uh, again, another huge thanks, Cinnamon and Sarah, for the time and the presentation. And that concludes uh, today's SGN webinar. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Bye now.